I'm going to talk to you about an old technology and how we've taught an old dog some new tricks that can improve security and help you out. I like names, um, so I have, I've collected a bunch of them and probably you have. So we're going to talk about how we use names for security. There's sort of three principles that I think power the internet. There's the network effect. The more things that you can connect to, the more utility you supposedly get out of the network. There's generative technology, which says you can use this old technology for new purposes. And that's one of the criteria I think about a great technology is you shouldn't be able to imagine all the things you could use it for. Whenever people say, could you imagine all the things that the DNS will be used for? And I say, no, and that's a good thing. And any technology is a good thing. For any part of the internet, there's two hard issues, scaling, which is kind of growing without bounds. Um, so that if you want to have more of something, you can have as much and there's no place where you hit a wall. And then there's federating, which is cooperating between multiple uh, different authorities. I think that, uh, you know, the real magic in the DNS is the fact that it gives everybody the control over their own namespace that's integrated into a global whole. When we talk about security, we're going to talk about the fact that the bad guys have used all of these principles to help themselves out. So that now the fact that I'm connected to millions of hackers, um, I didn't get any plus value, but they did. So they're enjoying the network effect. They've used old technology for new purposes. So denial of service attacks via DNS was not something that was in the original design, but it turns out it's something it's really good for. And then there's the issue about scaling and federating and how to trust the good people and not trust the bad people. Now, I always say that there's three parts to every distributed system. There's the hardware, or the software, and the configuration. And you may wonder why I use these icons. It's because hardware is like milk. You want the freshest possible. Uh, software is like wine. It usually gets better with age up to a point. We understand. And configuration is death and taxes. It's the hard part that actually lets the resources do something useful. And the whole business of the DNS and naming in general is to make configuration easy. Now, I said it's death and taxes, but in some ways it's more like heroin. You get addicted to using it for more and more purposes. So you may think that if you go to the cisco.com website, this is just a little tool that does a DNS lookup on cisco.com, uh, www.cisco.com. And it turns out that when you do that, where do you go? Well, you go through four layers of indirection that have something to do with Akamai, I think. Um, and then you get a bunch of different addresses, some in v4, some in v6, so that the binding here is nowhere near simple. What we've done is we've used the ability to put lots of configuration and store it in the DNS. We've made it easier so people use more of it. So it's actually something that they get addicted to. One way to look at this is that the web in 1980s, the way you loaded a web page is to just do one DNS lookup to find it, and you loaded it. Set up a TCP connection, you're done. It's great. Today, what happens is, is that, well, you go do that, but that's for the first aspect of the web page. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that's all stitched together. So if you go to the front page of the New York Times, it's sending you off to ad brokers for the ads, and it's all these insets and all of these things so Facebook can invade your privacy. There's a whole lot of components that get loaded. It's a big stitch, I don't know what you call it, a quilt, a crazy quilt uh, instead of a web page per se. The same thing with email. It used to be you just looked up a server address. Now you look up a list of servers, and you actually spend much more activity in the DNS trying to figure out if it's spam or if it's authentic than you do to actually deliver the mail. So there's much more involved in the DNS about making sure that spam doesn't get delivered than there is about making sure that mail does get delivered. And that says something about society, but it's true. Um, when you look at DNS history, this is one of my favorite things. So I'm going to tell you, you have to be a little bit careful when you have the experts tell you this. So for example, Wikipedia tells you that uh, you know the DNS was invented in 1983 for the ARPANET by the IETF. That seems like a fairly straightforward story. It'll also tell you that the IETF didn't exist until 1986. 
<laughs> so, you know, it was a very interesting thing. And it'll also tell you that the ARPANET was turned off in 1983, which is also, that, that, that is true. The third last fact is true. So, you know, the history of these things gets confused. But I think what we need to do is to think about the future and how we can be a little bit more secure in what we have. Part of this is complicated. This is a simplified diagram of the DNS RFCs. RFCs are those individual publications of standard. Each of these colored blobs is one RFC. The two that I think are green that are over on the far left are the ones I wrote. And then people have built more and more stuff on top of this. So the amount of configuration that's stored in the DNS has grown without bounds. Probably about half of those things are obsolete or wrong or missteps or so forth. But people have built into this database that is the DNS more and more of your configuration information. Um, we know that the DNS has created a bunch of security problems. Um, amplification attacks, if you can send a small request and get a big answer, particularly with UDP, it's easy to do these attacks where you multiply the effectiveness of the attack traffic by reflecting it off the servers and amplifying it. Uh, various forms of false data and rapidly changing, it's sort of like the getaway car, if you will, or just changing the name to, uh, in order to hide who you are. That goes on all the time. Uh, names that are difficult to process or understand. As I was kind of putting this list together a couple of days ago, I said, well, where would I find a good example of that that's effective today? And I said, never mind, I'm going to go to Facebook and read my Facebook posts. And the second one that was there was this article from the register about how if you click on these particular apple.com links, you're actually using the Cyrillic A character, which looks identical to the A character that you're used to, so that you can forge names with these international character sets if you happen to have like an A in your company name. Somebody can hack you by registering the one with the Cyrillic A which will look identical when you pass it to people and go, oh yes, apple.com, I trust that, that's fine. That's just one of the many examples. I mean, today when you think about handling configuration files that might have to have domain names that have Arabic, well, some of you can handle that. Okay, well, how about Chinese? How about Japanese? How about Korean? How many different you know, languages can you speak in domain names and be able to sort them out? So there's this question about, in, in the security world, how do you know how to filter out this bad stuff where you may not even be able to read it? Okay, well, so there's a problem. I think if we look at the basics of security, it always competes against functionality and cost. We're here at a security conference, so we all agree that security is really perhaps the most important thing. You know, we can't go anywhere without it. In the real world, you know, probably about 100 meters out there, people say, no, I want the new features first, and you fix the security when it happens. Or, no, I want the cheaper this or that, rather than buying the more expensive version with security. So the reason we all buy all of those cheap cam cameras is, well, they're cheap, you know. Uh, we all buy uh, Wi-Fi access points, we try and buy a secure one, but it's not always clear how we would know which ones are and which ones aren't. Um, so one of the things we have to think about is how do we implement security that's fairly inexpensive? Because there's this whole basic idea in security about, you know, the cost of the defense has to be less than the cost of the target, and you want the cost of the defense to be less than the cost of the attack. And this, don't worry, this is the most complicated mathematical expression I have in this talk. But the whole point is, is that you're on a budget with security. Uh, we tried to sell our security product to people that make uh, DSL boxes, as it turns out. And they said, well, we can't actually pay you for their code because that would put us at a competitive disadvantage. And more is the point, if you give us code, you have to figure out how to take out other code out of our box because we don't want to pay for the extra memory to put your free security code into our box. True story. Okay. Um, there's, you know, this whole issue of cost and effectiveness. 
If I think about a typical enterprise network today, it typically has four parts. There's whatever part of the enterprise workload is in the cloud, whatever part of it is in the laptop in a coffee shop somewhere with one of the workers. Uh, there's the traditional enterprise network, and then there's all this heating and air conditioning and stuff like that that's really the first stage of the Internet of Things that's hidden in the basement, and we hope it isn't connected. Uh, I think more and less, more and more today it is connected, but we're going to pretend it isn't and just concentrate on the first three parts. So what's the problem? Well, there's a whole bunch of traffic coming over the Internet to those parts. Um, you know, there's email and there may be SQL queries and web pages and all kinds of traffic. And what you really would like to do is to have magic glasses you could put on so that all of a sudden you go, oh my God, that's that red bad stuff and we have to stop that. We would like to be able, you know, that should come labeled with a skull and crossbones, perhaps. So the whole question is, how do you figure out what the bad stuff is? Um, you could filter by content, but you can't always take apart content and figure out whether it's dangerous or not. Uh, you can do it by source. Um, traditional firewalls do it by IP address. The problem you have today is that pretty much every content delivery network has these big servers. And these servers are filled with, depending upon your point of view, somewhere between 10 to 80% malware. Okay? Because everybody shares the same content server. It's like a library, right? You go into a library and there's a certain number of filthy books um, by whatever definition you have of that. So these libraries, you can't trust by IP address anymore. You have to think about doing it by name. Um, and that works with content delivery networks to some extent, and it's a big research direction, and I'll talk about that a little bit, bit uh, later. The imperatives here are you need to be able to share threat intelligence. The bad guys share information all the time, share code. What we need to do is to figure out a better way to share our threat intelligence. There's no security mechanism that's perfect, so you tend to think about having layered security. You tend to think... And one of the things I'm going to talk about is how you can have security that's kind of a fast path. It's not necessarily the most bulletproof, but it can work very fast, and that can help you out. And last, you need to automate your defense. The threat intelligence needs to be updated as constantly as you can have. And if you have your, your sysadmin that comes in at 8 o'clock in the morning, no, they never come in at 8 o'clock. They come in at 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, but that means that a few time zones ahead, the attackers have had a whole lot of time to play. So you need to think about automating the update of your threat intelligence. And that's the story I'm mostly here to talk about. Um, at ThreatStop, what we do is we went and bought, there's a bunch of free threat feeds and there's a bunch of ones you pay for and so forth. We have, I don't know, about 100 of them. Some of them are pure threat intelligence, some of the like geo-blocking, stuff like that. Um, and we put them in a database, and then we have our customers come along and give us a menu of what routers, what firewalls, what DNS servers they have, and which threats they're worried about. So, for example, it may be that somebody doesn't have any voice over IP stuff, so they're not really interested in about blocking voice over IP threats. Um, it may be that, you know, you, you're a seller of croissant out here, um, and you don't really care if somebody's ordering from more than two time zones away because it couldn't possibly be worth eating anymore after it's traveled that far. So you, don't, you want a geo block. Um, lots of different specialized rules. Um, and there's also a question about how paranoid you are. Um, one of our customers, for example, says, uh, well, after we found our printer talking to China, we would just kind of like our printer to only be able to talk to our interior network nodes. Those kind of rules you can create yourself and you need your own white and black lists. So we do that and we take all the menus, we take all the threat feeds, and we send them via DNS down into the routers and switches uh, and DNS firewalls. Um, and they're all customized. Now, you might say, well, geez, Paul, are you just bragging about the fact that your company does all this cool stuff? Well, I'm going to tell you that I think this is something that some scale or another you ought to be able to doing, ought to be doing for all of your networks. It may be you want to outsource it to people like us, or it may be that you want to do it yourself. I don't care. I think what you should think about is 
How do I get the best threat intelligence out there in a timely way? And also, how do I share with other people? Because that's a way that we detect an awful lot of the threats out there. All right, so the way this all works at the end game is the blue arrows represent DNS transfers to the different devices. The different devices will then be able to label some of the reds red and throw that traffic away. One of the big advantages to this is we usually find for most of our deployments that if we have the routers and the firewalls programmed at the edge of the network to throw away a lot of the, the traffic that's marked as being malware, then you get back 10 to 20, 30, sometimes more percent of your network bandwidth just by not having your devices have to deal with it. It's much more expensive to process stuff in your mail server and figure out it's spam and throw it away than it is to just throw it away at the edge of the network. What is this new DNS firewall thing? Well, it's standards are a work in progress, but it's available in Bind and other open source servers already. It speaks a thing called response policy zones and provides a way to have policies that override the usual DNS answers. For example, the typical one is you can say, hey, there's a name, and if somebody tries to access it, either send them to a web to a web page that says you shouldn't be going there, or just tell them it doesn't exist. So you just block the DNS lookup. You can also log it. One of the things that we're getting these days is with the thousands of new top-level domains up there, we're getting some of our users saying, is it these new TLDs, one or more of them, we just don't want to hear, just make them go away. That doesn't make us too popular with some of the registries and registrars, but it's a user choice from our point of view. Oh no, is this censorship? Well, you know, the EFF had this big argument and a lot of people thought about it when the government wanted to do this uh, back in around 2011-12, is this censorship. Uh, I think it's censorship, but not depending upon who does it. Um, my bottom line is these techniques are effective for improving your security posture. Um, and it's okay so long as the user controls the policy that's implemented. If you outsource it to your ISP or something, they should be following your wishes, not theirs. Your government may disagree with that point of view. It's effective because in the typical infection cycle, there's the download, there's the command and control, there's all of these different links on what the marketing people call the kill chain. And if you figure out how to interrupt any one of those things, the malware doesn't do its job, and you have won. You need choices throughout the food chain. You can implement this yourself, or you can have somebody else do it for you. Long term, I think we're, we're in the middle of, we've forgotten about addresses. They don't matter that much. We're learning how to do names in the DNS and other things. The research community out there thinks that in the future, all content on the internet will come in chunks, and every chunk will have a name, and it will be digitally signed, so that you'll be able to authenticate pretty much everything. One of the things I think it might be is you might also have another digital signature on there that says, if you can find this in the wild, we'll agree to pay you for it. It's just the way to find malicious content Somebody has insured you on that, their signature. They owe you. It's a little bit like bug bounties, except it's content bounties. Um, and I think it may be the way that we actually change the security game. Um, it's traditional to talk about security nightmares. I'll just leave those up there since I'm out of time. But thank you very much for your attention.